there won't be any issues, okay? So, what I want to do today is finish classification, okay? In relation to, um, we had talked a bit about um, spatially how we could uh, identify or classify weeds. We had talked about uh, herbicides, not weeds, but herbicides. Uh, we could classify them based on when the herbicide is applied. And now you've seen it in lab, you know, something's PPI like Treflan, Trifluralin or EPTC. You see things as pre's and posts. So that's one way that you could do it temporally in time when they're applied. Spatially, we talked about spatially, okay? What would be a spatial way of classifying herbicides? Spatially, so temporally was, you know, PPIP, what spatially? But I'm thinking more at the spatial level in terms of... Broadcast or Right, that's what, I'm, but I mean, that's, that's true by, by, you know, in, whether it's, right, ag and so forth, but really I was thinking here broadcast, banding, spot treatment, directed sprays, okay? You can imagine that, you know, I may ask you a question, something like that, you know, give me the various ways of classification. So if you're familiar with that, that would be great. And, and, and then we finished off last class uh, talking a bit about herbicides classified based on whether they're contact type herbicides. And now, as I mentioned some of these names, I'm gonna to try to reinforce the stuff you're seeing in the greenhouse for those of you who are in lab, okay? And that's to say we've got herbicides that are contact herbicides. A good example would have been Paraquat, okay? Uh, but also things like uh, Reflex uh, would have been a good example of a herbicide that's contact versus systemics, those that move through the symplasm and apoplasm. The living part of the um, of plants versus kind of the, what we call the dead plant, dead part of the plant, the xylem, okay? And I'm gonna go after we finish this, this section here, I'm, we're gonna get into absorption, translocation, and you'll see how these herbicides move. And in some ways, how they trick the plants in thinking that they're carbohydrates. They just hitch a ride and visit all the, the sinks in the plant, both uh, to the growing points and to the storage organs below ground, okay? And so then we talked about a residual. We, residual herbicide is one whose activity is retained in the soil for various periods. That's why in, in, in those review summaries for each of the herbicides at the bottom, residuality, short, i.e. Less, less than a month, okay? So Roundup has basically no residual activity, zero, okay? But you have something like atrazines, growing season could be carried over, and we call that carryover. You don't want carryover, typically, that they, in ag systems, because that could be a problem for the next year's crop that you're planting. Okay? However, you want residual activity, at least for the growing season, so you don't have to go in there and spray a couple of times. So often, growers, and, and this has been something that they're, with Roundup Ready crops, they've been thinking about is certainly uh, competitor companies to Monsanto is putting in uh, a residual herbicide uh, mixed in or applied in combination. So glyphosate could take care of, of anything that's already emerged, but what do you do if you've got emerging seedlings uh, you know, things germinate. If you can put down a residual, then you're pretty well, that's taken care of, okay? So, just so you get, a, you get a feel for it. And yesterday in lab, we started talking about that we can classify herbicides, okay? So this is classification based on mode of action. This is, this is the, the mode of action we talked about, okay? Photosynthetic inhibitors, okay? Can you name a herbicide that's a photosynthetic inhibitor from the group you saw, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday? Sorry? Command. Command, is that a photosynthetic inhibitor? Yes or no? That's a bleacher. Can you think of another? What, what was one that, that was supposed to show you intervenal chlorosis? Remember the ones, three or four, her, three herbicides? Or? Not the ALSs. Atrazine. Atrazine, metribuzin, linuron. Remember that group that I said, you, you know, we talked about, ah, you're going to have to look at the tomatoes to, to tell you the difference because we weren't seeing the symptomology yet. We were going to be seeing that kind of symptomology. It takes a little longer. Pigment inhibitors command, okay, Callisto. So mesotrione, clomazone, okay, um, is, is, in, is in that group. Cell membrane destroyers, what would be a good example? Cell membrane destroyers, something that's fast acting that, wouldn't be post. Dangerous, one of the most toxic of our herbicides. Paraquat, paraquat, okay. 
And, and I'm doing this just as a way to kind of, for us to get, don't, you know, if it's not hitting you, it's gonna come in time, okay? Cell division and cell growth inhibitors. What was the one that give you those stubby roots? Dual, metallochlor? Uh, nope, that's uh, oxen mimic. Uh, treflan, trifluralin. What was the other big one that we use? Pentamethylin, prowl, prowl, EPTC. So remember those were at the, at the end, they all, you know, plants looked, whether it was a shoot, root, and that's this, okay, cell division. So anything you get this really distorted growth. Um, now this is where Bob can give his answer. Growth regulators, dicamba, 2,4-D or 2,4-DB that we had in the, this, this is it. Lipid biosynthesis inhibitors, grass mary stem disorder, the ACC aces, who talked about post? Steven, this is post, cetoxidum where you're supposed, you know, you pull and it's just this, basically lipids aren't being developed. We'll go into some of the specifics. And then you have the inhibitors of amino acid synthesis, the ALS inhibitors and EPSPS. Do you know what this one is? That's glyphosate, that's glyphosate. And we talked about how the plant basically dies because of a um, uh, overproduction or at least accumulation of a toxic compound, not necessarily because it's missing branched amino acids that are produced through the pathway, and we'll talk about. It. And this is ALS, this is halosulfuron, uh, imazethapir, pursuit that you had examples, nickel sulfuron or accent, those are the ones that you saw close to where we had the paraquat and so forth in that last table that will turn the plants kind of reddish feel to them, okay? So again, this is, think about it in that way, try to categorize the, each of the herbicides. And, I remember, I kind of, I always remember cell division as, oh, the plants look really just weird, distorted. Clearly, there's some genetic stuff, DNA, you know, mis misfunctioning going on in mitosis. So find whatever way you can kind of think about these, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is just, not expecting you to, and you don't have those particularly in your notes, but just wanna say something about um, classification by, you know, chemical family, is this, is this a phenoxy, uh, phenoxy, and so forth, okay? And uh, just wanted to take you through that. That is all in your summary sheet for the 16 herbicides, but I just wanted to show you this. Don't be overwhelmed by all the, the information, but uh, for those of you who were wondering, are those the only 16? Uh, is it only atrazine that's in the triazine group? And that's what I wanted to show you. So these are the photosynthetic inhibitors, okay? S triazines, okay? Those include the one you need to know, and, and that's what I did, as I picked one from each of the group. But just wanted, to, for some of you who are familiar with herbicides, these are some of the other ones. Cymazine, Princep, that's what they sprayed up at Geneva under the apple orchards. It's got some good residual activity to control broadleaf weeds in orchards, okay? That's, that's what Phil had mentioned. Cymazine, or Bladex, has been banned in New York State uh, for uh, basically, uh, groundwater contamination issues, okay? But it is, it is uh, legal in other, in other states. Uh, and there's these other families in here, just for some of you are familiar, okay? So that's the S triazines of which uh, atrazine is our, one of our most important. There are other triazines in there. Um, that includes, okay, uh, metribuzin, Sencor. So this is the common name, these are the trade names. So metribuzin is sold as Sencor or Lexon. Lexone is, is uh, hexazinone, Velpar, any of you, um, if ever you're interested in blueberry production, you go up to Maine, okay? This is, Velpar is one of the most important herbicides in blueberry production to control broadleaf weeds. Yeah, and, and I've used it, I was, when I was working in Canada in some of the bogs, that's what we used. But again, you, I don't expect you to know it. In the substituted ureas, this is the family name, the, the key one that we have is Linuron. But some of you might have heard of Diuron or Carmex. Uh, is one of the trade names. Uracils, okay, Bromacil, terbar, and again, Terbacil, Sinbar. Some folks I know have used Sinbar, and they, they talk about. Again, you're not expected, I will not ask you, name six herbicides or three herbicides in the Uracil group. Focus on our 16, but I just wanted to give you a sense that what's also out there. And I'll try to actually print this out. I have actually a sheet that has all, pretty well, most of the herbicides and the common names, trade names for your own information that you can put into your notes. If ever in the future you just need to check, you could do it that way, just so you have, but you will not be tested on it, okay? Uh, then you have, this is the, the, 
benzothiazole group, hard bazagran, bantazon. We used to have it as part of our 16. I removed it just because you know, we could have 35 species or 35 herbicides in there. You certainly buckdrill, bromoxynil, we, we also had included, we have removed it. It's a benzonitrile. Okay, these are their own families. And again, there's more. I'm going to try to focus on the ones that we, that you're familiar with. And if any, you see anything here that, oh, I've used that or I know about it, I've heard about it. This is just how wide this is. Uh, we're looking at the pigment inhibitors, okay? And here's the, it's interesting that no chemical families recognize yet. They're not really sure where clomazone fits in. Sometimes you'll see it, I'm trying to remember in our group of 16, if what I've included for family, if I've even said it's there. But this is the one you're familiar with, you should be thinking about. Floridone or sonar, does anybody ever heard of that? You would if you work in golf courses or in aquatics. Um, this is one for the weeds competition. Uh, that was, um, so what had happened here is one of the, uh, the grower problems you had to solve, you were on a green, golf green, and uh, you, when you get there, the superintendent is telling you he doesn't know what's going on. There's basically, radially, uh, you're seeing dead, okay, dead turf, okay, on the green. And it's in, in, in a radio, almost like a bullseye, okay? It seems to be, and, and he's wondering what's going on, and you have to figure out, you know, you were an extension agent or something, or you were, you were hired by the, uh, the, the golf course to figure out what's going on. And so this herbicide was involved. So, so you go on the, on the green, and you're seeing basically spots of necrotic dead turf, but it's, it's in kind of a, okay, that kind of look to it. So what would be some question that you could, you could be, what do you think is happening? Aggressively worse on the outside? Uh, it's... Yeah, you, you could say that. Is it around uh, sprinkler system? Ah, yes. So it's gotten into the water from treating the pond within the course it's gotten into the area. Exactly, exactly. What had happened was the golf course was using, uh, and, and so the way it went basically is you would ask the superintendent, you know, what, what is it? Because right away you think, you know, disease. Disease is often, sometimes you'll see that, but it's clearly related to irrigation. And then, of course, you would ask the superintendent, say, hey, when did you last irrigate? Or did you, where did you get your water? He says, oh, yeah, we've got our pond down there. Oh, did you uh, spray anything? Uh, you know, what do you, oh, uh, yeah, I think we had some company guy, some, you know, weed control guy come in. We had some aquatic weeds growing in there, and he sprayed, I don't know what he sprayed. And he says, oh, what did he spray? And, and so, of course, you should ask, do you have the label? Can you contact him? Oh, yeah, but I think he left something with me. I think he, this is what he sprayed. He gives it to you, and it's fluoridone, sonar, which is often used. And you read sonar, and, and of course, then the question is, is this, the, yeah, it's, it's, you can use it. It's uh, legal to use in ponds. But the one thing that it says in the directions is, do not water anything. Use this water to irrigate anything for 30 days. And so they didn't know. The guys just went in, put the pump, and they were spraying, and they were killing the turf. And so, and this has happened. The person who, at, at Virginia Tech who put this together, that he had had it three times, happened three times during that year. And so that's, that's why sonar came to mind. Not that it's a, no, it's foreign, but it's amazing that kind of, you know, guessing you have to kind of think, what are they doing? And it was, you know, you would have to read the, the label to be sure that, hey, can I spray, can I use the water from there? Just like there's, there's periods that you can't harvest after spraying. There's, you know, uh, delays for some of these, these residuals. So. Anyway, that's, that's one that is in, and of course, it looked white. It was a bleacher. I mean, you look at the turf, man, the green, you go, oh, my God, this is, you know, you can't, you can't play on a green like that. Okay, so serious, and I don't know, and then and the question is, then you have to recommend what, does, what, does, what are you going to tell the superintendent? Is it game over for this year? Forget about this, this whole, go, go to the next one. And part of it was that if you would read, it, it actually would grow out of it. But, for, you know, for about three weeks, you have to tell the, uh, the golfers, sorry, this is what happened. But it's amazing. Imagine they did it, you know, it happened everywhere. They had sprayed all the home. It's, it's serious. So very, very important, you know, learn lesson there. Um, the other group that's in here, the, the trichotones, this is where Callisto, mesotrione is. It's, it's, it's a pigment inhibitor. Okay? Yes? Do you have command in that family? So is that the family we should, the next what says is like none generally accepted? In, in which family did I put it in? Isoxazole, yeah. I, I, I would put it in this group. Just, just 
follow that, I mean, because there's still debate, but just recognize that it's not that clear cut because it's a relatively new, new group, okay? So take command and put it here. The key that I'm really looking for you is, is recognizing it's a pigment inhibitor. But if I ask you what family it's in, do say, okay? It's the trichotones, put it in this group and command should definitely put it in this. I, I'm gonna follow what I have in there. But I just wanted to recognize it's not a 100% agreement as to what family chromosome is in. Some folks will say there's no family recognized. Others will say it's uh, isoxazole family. Use that, just, just to let you know. Is it, are you thinking sulf sulfatrazone? It's, uh, it's in this, in this, it's a pigment inhibitor. I'm pretty sure, I'll, I'll check it out, I, and we could check the herbicide handbook, but it doesn't come, anything that ends zone and stuff, it's pretty close. And I've seen some of the newer chemistries, I should add this, that's a good point. Some of the, are, you know, we don't have many new chemistries come out with new modes of action, but the ones that I have, like Callisto and so forth, are in this group. This is where it looks like what was down the pipeline. Remember, by the time a molecule is actually discovered in a lab, and it makes its way to the shelf where you pick it up, could be 10, 10 12 years in some cases. Um, so what you're seeing now is research that was done maybe, you know, five, 10 years ago. So if no research is going on now, that's why we're saying, I don't think there's gonna be much at the end of the pipeline if you're not feeding it. Uh, and so that's, that's a concern. And we saw that from uh, the IPM course that Wayne Wilcox said, you know, it's the same for fungicides, and I'm sure it's the same for insecticides as well. Cell membrane disruptors, inhibitors, Okay, these will directly affect the membrane. You know, you use sulfuric acid, uh, you know, you're gonna fry stuff, but obviously it's not very selective. And then these products are not. Okay, they basically dissolve the membrane. But, but the biperidiliums, this is induced lipid peroxidation. The lipids are just, and, and sometimes they say photosynthesis involved because it's, it's a combination. But it's really what, they, what paraquat or diquat, these are two biperidiliums okay, is that what they do is they really do lyse the cells. They basically, one thing that you should know about the cerbicide, the reason why it's got such high toxicity is that it, the actual product is a radical, okay? Do you guys remember antioxidants? You hear about that radicals in the body could really destroy cells and so forth. That's what this is. That's why when it comes in contact with the skin, it's in a very, um, what would I call it? It's a very destructive form. It's a radical and uh, it gets in your skin, it will really do a lot of damage, okay? And we'll, we'll go in detail as to what happens, but it's, it's a cation, cation that's extremely reactive, very reactive, and, and especially so in sunlight. So when you apply paraquat and it's sunny on top of that, boy, there's the, the reaction is gonna be, it's gonna be a quick one, okay? So, but just to show you, this is another, anybody use diquat? Okay, you'll see it more in close to water bodies. That's, that's the safer product to use in water, near water bodies, if you're needing to, to use, to control. Remember, this is a non-selective contact type herbicide. Does not move, and so you could see why in some cases, maybe close to, to water, and it's, as soon as it hits the soil, it's absorbed. So it hopefully won't, wouldn't make it. You don't want to spray water with it because it'll kill everything that comes, fish and whatever comes into contact. So you have to be careful. The diphenyl ethers, this is um, blazer, fomosafin is the one we're looking at, reflex. Uh, any of you are uh, strawberry growers, you probably use oxyfluorophen or goal to control perennial weeds and broadleaf weeds in strawberries, for example, it's an important one, but it's used in many other, okay? Cobra, if some of you are familiar, see, notice they all end in N, okay? This is, these are these diphenyl ethers. They, uh, they do a good job of controlling broadleaf weeds. This is the one that I was saying it's, it's only used in soybean, but I, you know, this is the one where we, we tell the growers, go away for two weeks, don't look at your soybean now, because they might get hit a little bit, and then they, you know, come back in two weeks, and, and the soybean are back, but the, broad, you know, the broadleaf weeds are gone. So that's the diphenyl ethers. They don't move very much. They're not translocated very much. They're almost like contact. They're applied, they move a little bit, and that's, they, that's where they do their damage. Uh, the, we don't have any, oh, this is the one I was thinking, Bob, Sulfentrazone is, is a, a relatively newer product, uh, Spartan Authority. Oh, there's the one I was thinking. 
Oh, the aim, oh, confrontation zone. So it is part of the diphenyl ethers. And they're all, you know, some people will actually call these the, well, the bleachers. They, 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 they all do that. So there it is. Okay. Confrontation zone. So, yeah, I knew it. Anything zone, I was thinking that's going to be in this, this general group. And here, uh, valor is one that you'll, you'll see, but inhibition of the glutamine synthase. This is an important enzyme, okay, that basically can convert um, ammonia which can be, if not converted, could be toxic to a plant. And that's how this thing, when this enzyme is shut down, ammonia is not broken down into glutamine, okay, an important product, and basically the toxic, those toxic levels kill the plant, okay? So, again, Liberty, Rely, Liberty Link, and so forth, okay? Again, I know it's a little dry because it's just these names and stuff, but hopefully now, you know, you just, it's a good way to try to remember them. Uh, mitotic disruptors. The, the nitroanilines, these are the ones where we have treflan, okay, is in this group, pentamethylin. But look at some of the others. Just to give you an idea, these are not the only ones that are out there. If you, okay, imagine having to memorize or remember all of these. Now, if you work for industry, you know what your company is selling. You know their products. You know what the competitors' products are. You know, you're just living this stuff every day. In your cases, you're just, some of you, the first time you ever hear of these things. So... You know, I understand that it's, you know, wow, look, and not only is the, tr you know, common names, look at all these, these names, and I don't know who comes up with these trade names, but I think they have some people in these companies that, you know, Barricade, Rancho, Rodeo, I mean, it just, just sounds, you know, Factor, Pentagon. What is that all about, you know? Kerbet. I know where this is being used. At the floral in Israel, Israel used, I think, in Kerbets, actually. Um, this, by the way, Bob, is the dithiopyr. We know this is an important crabgrass control in turf dimension. It's, it's, this is amazing. I mean, this thing is controlling a, cra a lot of crabgrass or a grass in turf, which is pretty neat. And this is a widely used product, actually, for those of you in the, in the turf industry. But it's a pyridine, okay? It also causes my, mitosis and disrupt. This is where you get that club rooting. You don't get the secondary root growth. So pretty, pretty scary, scary stuff. Okay? I told you there were 300 names. I mean, we're not showing you all the 300. Some other products, okay? Inhibitors of shoots of emerging seedlings. This is the one we talked about, EPTC. Which of these two trade names, Eptan or Eradicane, is the one that you could safely use in corn if you have a uh, crop safener? Eradicane, okay? So if you would just use Eptan, you would kill your corn. And it's important corn herbicide. This is the one that if you pull it out early enough, the roots look fine, the shoots look stunted in, annual, in the annual grasses. It's for annual grass control. Okay? But there's Triolate is another one, Fargo, look at all that. Uh, row neat, row neat. It's all sub subconscious. You know, your row of crops is going to be neat. Uh, inhibitors of roots only. Uh, we do have some, let's see, what do we have in here that we could, Sideron, we've, I've, been, I've worked with this. Uh, and then roots and shoots, the key one here is metallochlor, dual or pennant, okay? Alochlor, lasso is an important one. Yes, Megan? What's the difference if it's a root in, inhibitor of root and shoot seedling versus, uh, so it's just the shoots of emerging seedlings and the other one does roots and? Right, it's just in, yeah, it's just the activity, and it's hard because of, of you know, it's species-specific. You know, why is it that EPTC, I mean, it, it, it just affects the grasses much more in terms of their, their shoot, you know, just the, the, the chemistry of that herbicide. So, yeah, when we say shoot, this is of, of germlings. Remember, most of these products, most of these are applied, at least these, this is applied PPI. So, often you won't even see you know, you will get some growth, but you notice for some of them, you just see a few little things come out. The rest have germinated, okay, but they're killed right below ground. You don't even see them come out. And if they do come out, they're all twisted and, and you know, abnormal growth, okay? So, right, it's, it's, it's really looking at, so dual, when you look at dual, both the above, below ground, eventually, you know, in a week or two, all of them are going to show shoot and root malfunctioning. Because if it's the, the shoots are normal, but the roots are, are not, obviously down the road, the, the shoots are going to go and vice versa. So, uh, at, you know, at any one point, that's why I think, the, I think one of the members, you know, one of the students, you guys yesterday said, you know, it'd be good to put in there not just sprayed five days ago, but what date? So that if we come in next week, five days ago, what does that mean? When was it sprayed? So that you could see, you might say, oh, geez, after two weeks, 
the, the shoot roots look the same, even for eradicane, which is supposed to affect mainly the shoots, we see now that the roots have paid the price as well because the plant is not going above ground. And by then, then it's difficult. So um, for exam purposes, if I want you to tell the difference between EPTC or pendomethylin or, or trefline, let's say, but pendomethylin that affects the, one affects shoots, one the roots, we would be spraying the plants relatively, you know, soon, you know, maybe a day or two before you were to look at them, okay, or at least that they have merged so that you could really see, oh yeah, here the shoots are gone, the roots look fine then you would know it's EPTC. But if we give you the material 15 days later, they all look the same, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, and uh, this group, we do, we'll see some of it. Quinclorac, it's, it's, it is a turf herbicide. We do see that as well. Um, some folks will use it, facet. This is the Phenoxy group, 2,4-D, MCPA, Dicamba, okay, the growth regulators. Phenoxy acidic acids, phenoxy propionic acids, triclopyr. This is one that we use for those of you interested in natural areas management. This is what we use actually to, con uh, to work on swallowwort. It seems to be a, a little more efficacious than, um, than even Roundup, okay? Uh, but you will see a lot of Lontrell in natural areas management. You see a lot of these. Picloram is a good product, but long residual activity. You'll see this product used in uh, industrial areas where along power lines where you don't mind that there's going to be two-year residual activity because you don't want to have to go back every year and spray so that the power lines are clear of shrubs and so forth. But in a cropping system, you don't want this, okay? So this is, this is a lot of our natural area managers. Uh, Transline is a product, Pulperilid from uh, Dow AgroSciences that I've worked with. These are good products, but they, it's very often non-cropping non systems, okay? And this is that beautiful name I like to pronounce. These are the fops and the dims. The fops and the dims. Look at they all end in dim. Fop, these are all uh, lipid biosynthesis inhibitors. They're the ones that cause the, they only select for grass control. And they, they're ones that give you that mushy where the, the shoots break at the soil level. Okay. The one that you've got in here, let me just see. I think we just have cetoxidem. In the, in the last year and the previous years, we used to put in fluazifop something called Fusilate, some of you are acclaim, Phenoxaprop. So these are post only. They're only applied post. They're so, they have no activity on broadleaf weeds. So you do not want to use these. In, you're using these to control grasses, whether it's in corn, okay, uh, or alfalfa, and so forth. So widely used, very important. How many of you have used either acclaim or Fusilate here? Anybody? Which one? Fusilate. Yeah, in, in where, where were you using it? Yeah, and, and again, yeah, I keep forgetting. A lot of these, obviously, in some cases are in, in, in vegetables. Uh, let me just see. Okay, one thing you'll notice next week, let me just ask you this, especially for those of you who have uh, experience working with, with herbicides. If I have wheat, okay, or, or rye or barley, and I have annual grasses, what herbicide am I going to use in New York State? Does anybody? Do we even spray for annual, we, you know, for annual grasses in some of these crops? I mean, I'm just asking. I'm, uh, who, who grows wheat? Barley? Okay, Joe, what do you, do you guys do, and what do you spray? Do you spray anything? Yeah, we spray, but I don't know. Authority? I don't know. I don't know the reason I'm saying that is that I was very surprised when I first came to Cornell. That, and talking to Russ Hahn, who's our uh, weed extensionist in crops and soils, that they do not spray. They, there's no registered herbicide for annual grass control in our cereals. And the reason that they popped to mind is because in Canada and in other states in the, in the, in the plains and so forth, the, one of the products they use is something called hold on or whole grass, okay, controls grasses in a grass, diclofloc methyl, okay. And what's interesting about this and, and in, we'll talk more about it, is that the, this product, okay, is actually the, 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 so this is, it's not registered in New York, okay? So if I've got in, in rye or in barley, I have, I need to control grass. And in Quebec, when I, when I worked there, we had wild oats were the big issue. How do we control wild oats in, in wheat and, you know, and so forth? And this was the product we used. So here, for whatever reason, I don't know why there isn't an issue, if it's a climate or not, but it just blew me away that there isn't. This was the product. But what's interesting about this diclofloc methyl is that compound is actually not herbicidal. 
Okay? But what happens is that in susceptible annual grasses, for whatever reason, okay, you know how most plants try to detoxify a herbicide? It's, it's herbicidal and then they try to break it down like atrazine. That's what, why you could spray atrazine on corn, is that it is able to detoxify it into non-lethal compounds, okay, byproducts. Well, for whatever reason, those susceptible grasses, what they do is they take this product that's non, this chemistry that's non-herbicidal and convert diclofop methyl to diclofop, which is very herbicidal. It kills the plants. So it's kind of a reverse thing, and you would think selection over time, you know, somebody's going to figure it out. And, and, and we'll go, I'll show you this when we look at, uh, do a, the lecture on selectivity. And there's another product um, that, that there's the same, I think it's, I think it's Buttril or Buterac where basically the only reason why you can spray it in alfalfa is that alfalfa um, does not convert, convert two, so butyrac 2,4-D-B is used in alfalfa. But what happens is the susceptible species of broadleaf weeds, what they do is they convert 2,4-D-B to 2,4-D, which kills them. Hmm. Alfalfa does not do that for whatever reasons. Isn't that kind of a weird thing? So a non-herbicidal compound is converted to a deadly by those species. And you would, like I said, you would think evolution or selection after a while, maybe a mutant there doesn't do it. But that's the only reason we can do it. And we don't know why alfalfa doesn't do that. If it just select, and that's the only reason. Otherwise, it should have wiped out our, you know, it's a broadleaf. So two cases of where, why we get selectivity is that the favorable species that we want is not converting some of that, okay? And then this is the inhibitors of aromatic amino acids. What's aromatic, if I were to ask you? Ring structured, six carbon, okay? Double bonded throughout, okay? And so there's sulfosate or touchdown roundup. There's several others. Uh, rodeos in there, rancho. And now, of course, we talked about that yesterday that it's uh, roundup has gone generic. So Monsanto doesn't have exclusivity over it. So you've got all these companies, you know, Dow, you know, I think they have Syngenta's got touchdown. Then there's Glyphomax from a couple of the different companies. So, yeah, it's, 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 Pretty neat. Uh, and these are, okay, look at all the urons. This is the ALS inhibitors. They inhibit branch strain, not aromatic, but branch, aliphatic amino acids. You need amino acids, they're the uh, building blocks of proteins. You need proteins. Proteins are important for, you know, a lot of different plant functions and human functions, okay? And the one we're looking at is allosulfion. We looked at nickel sulfion, but look at the rest. This is a big group. This is also the group that has shown the fastest, quickest development of resistance because of a very specific mode of action, and we'll talk a bit about that, okay? So look at all the names, Escort, and you can see why, you know, this is another one that just came out. So if you've, if you've heard of some of these, okay? And this is it. Pursuit was in this group, Imazethapir, the imidazolinones family. So you can imagine how this is, this is something else, okay? Uh, Imaz Raptor, Arsenal, it's all, I mean, I think like it's war, you know, this is military type language here, you know, scepter, you know, it's like, it's cool. I'm telling you, they have folks that that's what their job is, come up with some name that's kind of the, the best, chopper, okay? And uh, inhibitors of oxygen transport, okay? distinct, some of these we, we folks do use, okay, but I, this is getting away a little bit from, from the main ones that are, you know, modes of action not clear, so, okay. Uh, this is not all your, your, your class list, I've just highlighted some of the ones you need to know, okay, I don't know if you can see it, Linuron, uh, Metribuzin, Atrazine, but I just try to, to break them up in this, in this fashion so that you could I just wanted to reinforce that after seeing all that, this is what hopefully we'll narrow it down to some of these, okay? And, and so in your own minds, try to divide those up in at least the key 16. Where would they fit and what are some of the, um, the characteristics, okay? EPTC, the amides, although you don't have to know about uh, Devernal, okay? Um, th those are important to keep, keep in mind. And there's the trade name. Often you'll see it either with the, uh, you know, copyright type, registered product or you'll see it in, in uh, capital letters, trade names, okay? So there you go, I'm not gonna go. Just wanted to mention why, they're, why it's so much easier to call these the FOPs and the DIMs. These are the lipid biosynthesis inhibitors. 
And what we'll do is go through, and I'll show you how these actually end, end up working, okay? So I think you've got all that information. I had put this in time just to, to kind of, and this is another way you could do it, not selective, selective. Are they translocated, not translocated, okay? Because this will tell you, and then if you could divide that up, yeah, they're translocated, but where? In the xylem, in the phloem, both? Because that'll tell you where you're supposed to see the injury first, okay? So if you could kind of do that for our various, our 16, that'll be really helpful, I think. If you could kind of, just to get a better handle on how they, they work. I'm not gonna go through each of the structures. I mean, that's, and that you won't be asked either. But just for those of you who are keen on the, the structures and why, what they look like, you know, the aromatics, there's atrazine. And we'll talk about why it is, what corn does to basically break down this herbicidal, her, you know, product to a non-herbicidal kind. It's got some neat things. And in fact, some species are somewhat tolerant because they can only do part of that conversion. They can't do it fully, and that's why they're killed. Okay? And so, but what, what it's telling you is that if you use, you do, you know, you use too much of a product, these, they can break it down. They will also, your favorable crop will get killed. Okay? So again, rates are important. That's why sprayer calibration is so important. Okay, because it's not their tolerant forever. I mean, you, you overdo it, okay? So, what I want to do now is go to this, this part here, which should be cool, okay? So, keep that in mind. So, we're moving to that, that second handout. Did all of you get it then? It's uh, herbicide absorption translocation. Anybody need a, uh, okay. Okay, here you go, Joe. Uh, Oh, it must be here. I just need one here. Okay. So let's take a look at the, you know, apoplastic transport. Okay. That's going to be the xylem pathway. Two major pathways of plants. And this is going to be important. If you grasp this part, it's going to help you figure out where you're going to see damage first. But for those of you, just a quick summary of the basic plant fizz. This is the apoplast, is the pathway for water and minerals to move from roots through up to the plants, okay? Inter they go, it goes, the, the, the pathway is through intercellular spaces. It does not go right through the cell, okay? And, and I'll show you. Uh, and what happens is, and I'll show you a cross-section of a root, you'll hit what's called the Casparian strip. If you're trying to go into, at some point, you are forced to move inside, okay? Something called the endoderm where wa water materials must enter the cell. So what I'm saying here is you need to be aware of this because this might create some selectivity. This might stop a herbicide from moving in. Is this the case? Just like the cuticle. So this is for soil applied, okay? Keep in mind, the apoplast is non-living, okay? And transport is driven by the transpiration stream. As the plants transpire, they bring up through capillary action, up through the xylem, up to the edges. So water is going to move to the edges, and out through evaporation, evapotranspiration. Okay, that's the driver. That's how nutrients and water move in plants. Okay, I think most of you, hopefully, that is referred to as the apoplast. Whereas herbicides that move through the symplasm. Okay, so examples of apoplastic movement include atrazine, the photosynthetic inhibitors. A lot of them go only through the xylem. But things like, okay, 2,4-D and glyphosate move through the symplasm. And what that is, pathway of moon materials from foliage to other parts of the plant. So you apply them here, and they're moving both above and below. They're going from what we call the source, where the photosynthates are produced, to where they're needed. It's like you, you know, you eat, here's the, the food coming in, but then it's to all the different parts that need it. So what are some of those sinks? You know, meristematic tissue, young plants, they're growing, they need the energy, roots, uh, tubers, rhizomes. Okay, that's where the plants are moving once they start photosynthesizing. So things like quackgrass, that's why they tell you spray Roundup on quack when it's got three, four leaves. Because you need enough foliage to take up that material, and that material is being moved both above and below. If you just have one leaf, that's not going to cut it. Okay, transportation is through the cell cytoplasm. So these products have to get through the cells. They're not going through intercellular spaces. Okay. They're going to go through. And what connects one cell from, to another cell? You know how you got the cells? There's, there's something that connects them. How can material go from the cytoplasm of one to the other? Do you remember? 
There's a term, there's a structure. Starts with a P. P L A. Pla Plasma does matter. Plasma does matter. Man, yes. Don't you wish you remember that uh, plant, you know, plant course, plant biology 241 or 34, whatever? Ah, oh, man. Uh, it didn't make sense then what all that stuff was for, but that's, that's going to be important, okay? So the key thing is transportation through cell cytoplasm and the phloem, living tissue. That is why these products that you're going to use that are going to move through the, the symplasm cannot kill the plant too fast. If these th things hammer the plant, you're not going to get the transport. The, 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 basically, the highway shuts down, and you're not going to get that compound to where it's needed, to the site of action. The site of action is where does the plant actually do its killing. Or, or the herbicide, I should say, in this case. Okay? It's living. It's the phloem. Simplast is living. Tranquil is driven by distribution of substances around the plant. Okay? From sinks to sources. Um, concentration differences. It's not the water. It's not transportation. Some herbicides use both. Okay? So, just want to give you an idea. Okay? If you place uh, direction... If I place a, um, let me just see which one I could show you, okay? If I place a uh, apoplastically moved herbicide on this leaf, okay, what's going to happen is because of, of uh, transpiration, transpiration stream, it's going to move to the edges, okay? So I, put, I, I spray here, you know, atrazine. It'll be moved along with the transpiration stream through the xylem and so forth and exit through stomates, okay? and you get evapotranspiration. So that's why you see damage in older leaves first, because if it's coming up from the soil, it's taken up, it'll hit the older leaves first, and then the leaf margins. If the product is symplastically moved, like glyphosate, and you apply glyphosate to the leaf here, what happens is, okay, it's going to be moved both, okay, basopetally, I, towards the base, to the rhizomes, okay, this could be something like uh, Canada thistle, but it also will be moved upwards to, a, to another sink, which is the growing tip, the growing area, the meristematic tissue. So you will see damage, you can't see below ground unless you pull it, in some plastically moved herbicides at the top. And that's why Roundup, if you remember that milkweed, you looked at it, it was right at the top. That's where you saw the first death. Okay, keep that in mind. That becomes very important. A couple of things to think about. If you've got a plant that's senescing and you're spraying your herb or it's wilted because it's too hot or too dry, useless. Useless particularly for both, actually. Xylem transported herbicides or phloem transported because it's shutting down. It's senescing. There's no movement of water anymore. There's not enough water. That's why when you spray, you've got to make sure the plant is actively growing. That's why when you read sometimes the label, plant should be actively growing. What they mean there is that you don't go in there and there's been a frost or it's been 95 degrees, no water for two weeks, and the plants are just like this. That is not only are you spraying the ground probably, but also they're inactivated, okay? Senescent leaves, one, do not export herbicides, whereas young expanding leaves and shoot tips act as sinks, okay? So this is visually, think about that when you apply products. So atrazine is both soil applied, can you comply pre-emergent PPI and post, but it's xylem transported. Okay, so that's very important to think about that. Okay, so to be effective, what does a herbicide have to do? Okay, we're, think, we're th talking about how is this, this thing absorbed and translocated. Okay, first of all, it's got to come if, if it's applied to the leaves, for example, let's talk about something like glyphosate or even paraquat. It's got to be in contact with the leaves. It's got to be there long enough to somehow be taken in. The plant is not going to open up its doors and say, come on in. The cuticle is going to be a major barrier, much more than roots are. Okay? It has to penetrate into the plant and move to the living site in sufficient quantity to, to disrupt some vital, important cell okay, process. And the reason sufficient quantity is that's why they don't tell you, do not spray Roundup when you have one or two quack grass, quack grass leaves. Because, yeah, it'll be transported, but there's not enough of the product that's going to kill, especially a well-established, um, you know, stand of quack grass or yellow nutsedge, okay? So, you contact the surface, get in, which is going to be tough. You're going to have to smash the door down or do something to get into the cells. Nobody's going to open the door for you, okay? And then move. How are you going to move? You got into the house. How do you find your way now where's to where you're supposed to go, 
or you know, into a building and so forth. So that's going to be the challenge. Okay? From the soil, so this is for uh, surface, okay? The herbicide has to be available in the soil solution. It's got to be able to mix in with the water because it's going to hit your ride with water and nutrients. Okay? And one thing you should keep in mind is that plant structures like the seed, okay, or roots will take up herbicides. There are some herbicides, you know, and, and I know I had said, you know, the, the, the seed, you, you know, herbicides don't kill the seed per se. What I, you know, I just wanted to, bring, you know, reiterate. What I mean there is like a dormant seed, okay? The herbicide's not, there's no activity. But if the seed hasn't bibed, i.e. it's swollen, it's taken up water, then that is already, germination is started, is occurring, okay? It doesn't have to be when you start seeing the radical coming in. And so that, some herbicides will go, trefline is a good example, trifluorin will go right in. And you will, you will see basically the hypocotyl or the radical, the precursors to the shoots and the roots, basically never even emerge from the seed, okay? But you see the swelling and stuff and it just rots away and dies. In other cases, it'll actually, you'll see these structures, okay? But clearly this is important. Often, and, and the key is the roots. The secondary roots have to take up the product, okay? Otherwise, it's not gonna happen, okay? So, herbicide uptake through, and again, all this information is in your notes in some form or other. So, it's kind of, you know, going through this and knowing that you've got it in there. Absorption through the cuticle, okay? Anything that's oil soluble is going to make it through. Remember, what's, you know, the cuticle is, and I'll show you what it's made out of. It's waxy. It's waxy. It does not like water. Water, if you spray any product, it's going to bead. That's why we looked at formulations. Remember, we were talking about emulsifiable concentrates because it's going to be like you wax your car. After you wax your car and it rains, you know, the water beads up, okay, rolls off. That's not what you want. You want it, that's why you have stickers, spreaders surfactants, okay? But if it's oil soluble, they'll get in a, a lot more, okay? They're gonna be lipophilic. They like lipid, but they're water, you know, hydrophobic. You know, that cuticle is gonna be hydro, water phobic, does not like it, but lipophilic, likes oil, okay? So what, if most of our herbicides, though, a lot of them are water soluble, and so that's why you need to have these wetting agents, surfactants added, and so forth. Cuticles can have different components of waxes, and we'll show you, okay? Herbicides can be washed from the leaf surface by rain, okay? But typically it takes one to 24 hours, okay? We now have products that basically, uh, glyphosate has come out now with a new product. Uh, it's, uh, what is it, uh, what is it called? It's like half an hour. They're rain fast, period. Rain fast just means how long does the herbicide have to remain on the leaf such that if it rains, you get a downpour or something, you're still going to have an effect. It's now down to half an hour. Whereas I remember, you know, when, when I was working with my stuff, I had to wait 12 hours, and sometimes I had to pray that it wouldn't rain within 24 hours. And in this kind of area, in this area, forget about it. I mean, just wait, you know, two minutes and you'll get a, it'll rain in Aurora, won't in Ithaca, and Watkins Glen, you'll get rain. I mean, it's, this is, coming down, you know, and, and herbicides are the most rain fast, but we've, the, the chemistry there, surfactant chemistry is cool. Yes? I don't mean to go back, but for herbicide uptake from the soil, how does pH play a role with the pH of the soil? Like, it's, it, how does it affect it? It's, it's basically the, it, it it'll, would be, it's not as, as, as problematic as, well, it'll be, it'll be an issue if it's, um, particularly if it's acidic. The more acidic the soil is, that's where you have things like atrazine that are taken up by soil really kind of have difficulty getting in. They basically, outside pH, inside pH varies, and, and, and a lot of the herbicide will, will not be taken up, just like some nutrients. So that's why sometimes, you know, pH plays a role, and it varies by herbicide based on their chemistry. But I know, for example, that's one issue with, with atrazine when we have low pH soils, you know, in the range of uh, four and a half and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of them, that hexazinone, Velpar, yeah. So keep that in mind, and, and, it, it's, and if you want to know, you say, how do you know this information? It would be on the label. They would tell you on the label, you know, just like make sure you don't use, he you know, uh, heavy water, uh, just be careful pH. pH range of this soil applied should be, or your organic matter content should be less than 4%, or no more than, you know, 5%. Don't put this in on muck soil, for example. 
because the, uh, the herbicide is an adsorb, not adsorb, but adsorb to soil, and it's just not available. So, good point when we, we talk a little bit about the, the uh, herbicide, so, uh, in soil uptake. So, particular penetration, okay, these are the, if you want conditions that will favor the uptake through the cuticle, because the cuticle is going to be in good shape, you want high humidity, that's usually good, okay, adequate soil moisture, you do not want stressed plants. Okay, you have stressed plants, just like if you have stressed corn or stressed weeds, they're useless. They don't work very well, okay? And you want warm temperatures. You don't want extreme temperatures, okay? Uh, so, uh, what also happens, okay, remember about the cuticle? What happens to the cuticle if you have very hot, very dry conditions, typically? Think about desert conditions. What do cuticles, how does the cuticle look? It's thicker. It's thicker and it's just, just very, th you know, thick. And you could see that if you look at a, you know, an, an example would be a maple tree. All of you guys know maple tree. Take a look at the outer leaves of a maple tree, especially if it's growing alone in your front yard or whatever. Take a look in the summertime and how hard and tough it is. And then go on the inside and take a look at one of the shade leaves on the inside. They're going to be this paper thin, very fragile, even in the middle of July. Very, you know, very susceptible. Okay, that's why we say, you know, you don't want stuff that's drought stricken, that has a thick cuticle because the herbicide is just not going to get, the wax is thick, it's just very difficult to penetrate. What basically the plant is doing is trying to protect itself from, from losing water. But that's not, we want it to take up stuff. So, if you're ever in a situation now, where we have an advantage in New York State, as we have, I've mentioned a few times, that it's usually our, our rain is not a problem. It's, the problem is with rain is that we need to apply it and there's too much rain. It's not like we're in the you know desert southwest where you've got to irrigate and make activate these herbicides. Yes, Ben. In that case, when there's dry, when the cultivation, that would be better. The the issue here though is that uh, it's you're also stressing your crop. The crop. I mean, you'll see your corn. I remember 1989. It's still in my mind. You know, this area here was terrible. Driving down the 81 from Canada. I mean, the corn was started out decent, somewhat decent. It was stressed. And by the time I got down here and then went to central Pennsylvania, it was basically pineapples and onions. I mean, literally, you'd see the corn just rolled, the leaves. If any of you have seen it, it's scary. It's this light bluish green color. You, you clearly know this. It was the worst year we had, a drought for the whole period. Herbicides didn't work, but the, didn't matter because the corn wasn't going anywhere, unless you were irrigating. And remember, for, you know, we don't do much irrigation here. Further south, Delaware and so forth, they, you know, most of their, all their vegetables are irrigated and about 40% of their corn is irrigated, and particularly if you're going out west as well, okay? So, if I were to say what are some environmental conditions that would encourage the uptake of, of herbicides, these would be the kind of things to think, to think about, okay? You don't want frost, you don't want the plant shutting down. Anything that shuts down the plant is not good if you're trying to get a herbicide in there, okay? Uh, contact herbicides, they have limited mobility, okay? Paraquat is a good example. Injury is localized to the area of the spray droplet. That is why good coverage is essential here, okay? If you have a dense canopy where one weed is, is protected by another individual, the top individual gets sprayed, he's dead. This guy's going to be there, okay? So that's one of the issues, you know, you have to really get good coverage. If you just hit part of that, the leaf, that part of the leaf dies, but not the rest, unless it's most of the leaf is gone. And you saw that with our, uh, uh, what, what did we have there, the uh, burdock burdock plant, okay? Apoplastically, so if you, f you read in the notes that, oh, this herbicide is transported by the xylem via xylem, a synonym is apoplastically transported. That's the same terminology. Moves upwards only, very important. Accumulates in leaf tip and leaf margins. These are the hints when you're gonna do that practical exam. Look for that damage. Where am I seeing it? And just like when, if you've taken the soils courses or mineral soil, what do they tell you about you know, looking for nutrient deficiency. Is the element, you know, transported? Do you see it first in the old leaves? Where do you see the magnesium deficiency, zinc deficiency, iron deficiency? Same thing here, okay? Apoplastically transported herbicides cannot move into and accumulate in underground st structures. Do not try to control a perennial with a deep tap root or, or rhizome using a herbicide that moves through the apoplast. Useless, useless. Wasting time and energy and money. Injury progresses from older growth to newer growth. 
key, key, key stuff to remember. Well, after you leave this course, this is, you might not remember any of the herbicides, but you'll remember, oh, I know that. Well, you know, I'll find out how does this thing move. Okay, and you could read that. That information is, is, is available. And this is what we're showing here. Uh, when applied to a point of a leaf, a plastically translocated herbicide, look what happens. Okay, Mo does not move with the transpiration stream. This is B. Okay, basically moves downwards through the phloem and upwards. Okay, why is this thing moving down and up? What is it moving in? In the phloem. What's moving typically moves in the phloem? Sugars and food. The plant is photos. This is a leaf. It's photosynthesizing. It's producing the glucoses and so forth, and then ships to where it's needed. It's shipping the food, the production center. Okay. Whereas the apoplastically, okay, translocator moves to the edges of the leaf, okay? And of course, those that are, have no movement or very limited movement, okay, fumosafen, paraquat, that's wherever they hit, that's why the coverage is going to be important, okay? So that's an important distinction, very important distinction with these herbicides that you need to just, just be aware. Don't want to bombard you with uh, basic plant physiology here, but you should just be aware of a couple of things, okay? So, this is, okay, um, just want to show you when you're, this is a cross-section of a root, okay? And um, I'm just trying to see, I just changed this for myself. And So, anything that's moved apoplastically in the xylem, okay? So you have some, some herbicides that uh, don't think that apoplastic or symplastic herbicides have to always be applied to the leaf. I mean, there are some herbicides like 2,4-D that move through the phloem both when they're sprayed on the leaf, but they're also in the soil. Okay, 2,4-D can still be moved up, and what it's doing, it still only moves through, it can move xylem and the, and the, uh, the phloem. But if it's going to move through the xylem, which most soil-applied herbicides move through the xylem or the, apo, the dead part of the plant, they come in into the root hairs, and I don't know if we're showing it here. See, root hairs and so forth. So think about what we've done here is cut this root, and we're now looking at it, okay? And so it's, it's moving in. What I'm saying is that these, these, these herbicides that move through the apoplasm move in between the cell walls, the intercellular spaces. They're not going through, like this stuff, through these plasmodesmata, or these connections between cells, okay? And so you would say, oh, okay, that's cool. They're just kind of getting around the edge. They're going along a fence line, but they're not going into any of your properties. Everybody's just the hedgerow. They're moving. However, they're going to reach a point where they hit a barrier, okay, which is called the endoderm, okay? These cells, if you take a cross-section, have something in, they're suberized. They're waxy, okay? And they have something called the Casparian strip, which is suberized. Now these xylem-moving Okay, the xylem moving products cannot sneak around in the intercellular spaces any longer. Decision has to be made. Well, they're going to have to move through the cell. They have to go through this, suberized. What I'm saying here is that there's, now there's going to be a selection barrier. So far, there was no selection. These guys, you know, so atrazine, you know, can dissolve in water and, and it's transported along with water and nutrients through the intercellular spaces and thinking, I'm going to make it up the xylem, I'm going to get into the leaves, but a problem occurs. There's a security zone. The security zone is this endoderm. And it's got this Casparian strip that's superized and waxy, and that might behave as a selective barrier and say, no, you're not going in. That's a herbicide. You stay back. Nutrients go in. You know what I mean? There's, it happens here. Whereas anything that's symplastic, okay, that has to move through each of the cells through these plasma, plasma desma, what else does it have to do? Do you think there's more selection if you're moving through cells than if you're moving around them? Of course. What does the cell have? Membranes. The plasma membrane is very selective. Some things are going to come in, some things are not. Having said that, and now that you're thinking, boy, well, how selective is this thing? It turns out that it's actually not very selective. Even the Casparian strip, at least with many of these herbicides, will allow them in. It is n not nearly as selective as the cuticle. Okay? So in general, for soil-applied herbicides, selectivity is not an issue in terms of that the, you know, the roots are going to stop things from coming in, root membranes. This is especially true the younger the plant is. If it's a seedling, and that's why some of our pre-emergence works so well, 
And why is that? Why is it that the younger the plant, okay, the, the, the less it's an issue? It's trying to uptake so much stuff. Okay, but what else is related to that? Okay, but I'm t what about soil? For soil applied herb, I'm, I'm referring to soil. Why would a young seedling for a soil applied herbicide be even more susceptible? And it's related to what you just said. But the Casparian strip is not well developed at all. It's just, just the same. The cuticle isn't developed. These, so that's why those pre-emergent herbicide or PPIs actually do really well. Because the older the plant is, the more this thing can be selective. Okay? But when the younger it is, it's just like anything. Aren't kids typically more sensitive to carcinogens to, you know, than, than adults are? Or, or you know, just because they, they're, they're actively growing, as you talked about, and they're just taking, they, you know, and they're less selective. They don't have, you know, the selectivity. So that's why that, that's important. Yes. And that's just because of like a convenience. Uh, convenience, it's much easier to spray post a pre-emergence. That's the main reason, the extra equipment, extra time, the, the, the advantages and disadvantages that I talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Still practice somewhat in, in vegetable production because of high value crops. You don't want to, you don't want to do it. And if you have the equipment, but otherwise, yes, definitely on the way out as far as we can see. Okay. So you get the idea that these apoplastically transported herbicides go in the intracellular space, intracells, between cells, and then we'll hit this, this endoderm, okay, which you would think is gonna, now they have to move through this strip, and that's why they're saying, and then afterwards, so they come through, the, and we'll move up through the xylem, okay? So this is what they're showing here in C, I believe. Vessel elements of the xylem tissue, no thick cell walls. These are non-living tissues. They're basically connections, like a flute, if you remember, okay? Whereas, in the phloem, you've got these companion cells. You know what these little dots are? Those are nuclei. This plant, I mean, this, this structure is alive. And uh, that's why you can't have it be dead or, or the herbicide kills the, the, the cells. It's gone because this thing needs to be bringing things up and so forth. So sieve tubes and companion cells are, are related. And you notice there's pores in this, okay, in these sieve tubes. That's how the, the photosynthates move. And they move up and down, okay? So think about this. What happens when you get these rabbits at your place? Well, some of you guys know them or at your, and, and they start, what do they do when they browse around the stem? And, and you know, they just, and, yeah, they girdle. What happens to the plant? What do you think they're knocking off? Often the, the first thing on the outside tends to be, tends to be the, you know, there's the bark, but then I think the xylem is the first. So water becomes an issue. And if they go deep enough, if you see the girdle really deep enough, they, they knock off the foam. And sometimes you see the plant is still alive if it's just got a strip of bark that hasn't been, you know, they've gone three quarters, but they're still, it's, it's you know, having trouble, but it still survives for a bit, okay? But that's what girdling is removing. It's basically clearing out this tissue that's around, okay, that's on the inside, okay? So take a look at a cross-section of a stem, and you'll see what I mean with, with girdling, okay? So, the key point here, though, is that uh, 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 symplastically moving herbicides will have to go through the cells through these connections called plasmodesma, that's plural, plasmodesmata, okay, uh, and then moves up through the foam, but it's living tissue, okay? I'm not going to ask you, draw this for me, but just understand, to, the take-home message is that the foam is a living tissue, the, those herbicides cannot be fast acting. Okay, that's why 2,4-D is not going to kill your, your, your dandelions in two days, like Paraquat will, okay, or even some xylem transported herbicides. Okay, so what are these symplastically translocated herbicides? They move downward in the plant from source to sink. This is just a summary, it's all in the notes, okay. They travel through the phloem with sugars to actively growing parts, the sinks, as we refer to them. These foam mobile herbicides must be used if control of underground perinating structures is desired. Canada thistle, field hedge bindweed, okay? Uh, leafy spurge, that's the kind of herbicide you ask, you read, you say, hey, wait, wait, is this thing moving in the phloem? Is it, is it going to be transported? Is it registered in where I want to use it? Okay, some herbicides diffuse across the cell membrane to the sieve cells and are, are trapped. Okay, 
And, and I'll show you what, what this ion transport, it's, it's a hypothesis as to how do these things actually get into the form? How do they fool the plant in thinking, hey, I'm, I'm a you know, carbohydrate, I'm glucose or something, okay? And uh, some of them are actively transported across cell membranes and they expend the energy. ATP is the currency for energy in plants, remember that? And they, certain carriers are involved, and this is, you know, gly glyphosate phosphate carriers. This is getting into heavy herbicide physiology, and I won't get that. But just recognize, in some cases, these herbicides are actively, energy is expended by the plant. It's crazy. You, um, you know, how does, why does it do that? Why doesn't it know this thing might actually kill it in, in time? And we'll talk, talk a little bit about that. Some plastic transport, just to tell you, you don't have this, but does anybody know what these things are in velvet leaf? It's magnified 150, it's a leaf surface. Starts with a T. Trichomes. Trichomes. You know, the little fur and, and, and hairs. They're bad news not only for insects trying to get in there or fungi, but also for, you think about your, your, your herbicide, you know, droplet sitting there. It's a barrier. So that's where I'm saying, you know, when you're applying a herbicide to a leaf, the hairier it is, the more it's got spines and stuff, the more difficult it is. Same can be true if it's really waxy. So the two extremes, hairiness, pubescence, and really waxy. You can think of onions, for example, or cabbage. So glossy. Think about how hard it is to get a herbicide that needs to get into the leaf. Okay? So this tends to be somewhat of a barrier. These are the stomates. This is field bindweed stomates. That's where some of these products are going to come through. Okay? But those are, those are going to be general barriers. Okay, uh, just wanted to show you this. Five things that can happen to a herbicide once it contacts the leaf surface. Okay, so you guys are spraying and you go, okay, what, what, what are some possible things that can happen? Number one, bad. They vol volatilize, it's too hot, okay, or it's windy, it's gone, that's useless. Or it's washed off, it didn't stay long enough, it rains, it's gone. Bad, number one, you don't want that. Number two, remains on the surface, okay? You want that. Penetrates the cuticle and remains in the cuticle, not good. That's not going to help you that much, especially if you need to get this to an active, an active point, okay? Uh, penetrates the cuticle, enter the cell wall, and translocate into the xylem, to the, to the simplex, okay? So this is the intercellular movement. Remember we talked about it in between cells? This is the conductive vascular tissue. This is what moves things up and down, right? That I talked about, okay? Penetrate the cuticle, enter the cell walls, and translocate it in the phloem to the symplasm. This is where the nutrients are moved. That's where glyphosate will move in, okay? So you want this, okay? These three, one, two, and three are useless. They, they're not helpful. You're wasting money. You're polluting the environment. You want four and five. How do you do that? The plant's going to throw everything at you. Okay, to try not to get you to do it. Because of this, the cuticle. This is a cross-section of a cuticle of every plant. Okay? It's got waxes. Okay? These are these guys here. Embedded and epicuticular. They're on the surface. It's got these strands that are called pectin. And it's got cutin. Okay? Three components. Waxes, pectin, and cutin are the three components of a cuticle. And then you get cellulose, and if they can get through here, if a herbicide can get through here, that's cool. What is the major barrier to a herbicide, water-soluble herbicide getting in there? Wax. That wax, this is the main, okay? If it hits, cutin is actually not too bad. It, it, it can take some water. The, the, the best at taking up water, the most hydrophilic component. Not, that's, I always thought, you know, when I remember when I first learned this, I thought, I always thought the cuticle, oh yeah, the cuticle is bad, it, and nothing's going to go. But there's a component called the pectin strands are tremendously hydrophilic. They love water. If the herbicide can hit those, it's going to be taken up easily, get, making it through, getting through the cellulose. This is no problem getting through. It's getting in through here. And so the goal is to keep the herbicide up here long enough, okay, to hit one of these strands. And that's why sometimes if there's some tearing of the leaf, or, you know, that might allow it, or there's some herbicides that have surfactants that basically erode away part of the wax and allows the herbicide to come in. And some of these strands are very close to the surface, okay? So it's basically getting past this. 
That's the real issue, okay? And that's why it's, you know, keeping that herbicide on there long enough, okay? Let me just... That's a clearer shot, and you have that, of what happens to a herbicide, okay, that moves through the symplasm, okay? I just wanted to show that you have that there. Um, one goes through the intercellular spaces, one goes through the cells, okay? I just want to show you... Okay, I will get you this slide, okay, I just wanted to show you this, uh, because it'll give you an idea of, you don't have it in your notes, but I'm going to make a photocopy, or just email it to you, to give you an idea of how some of these herbicides are moved. So it would be a good idea for the 16 herbicides that you have, to get an idea of where do they move, do they have good mobility, and if so, do they move in the apoplast, the symplast, or both? So for example, glyphosate has excellent mobility, it moves well in plants, and it's through the symplasm, okay? Uh, we do have a number of them, okay, the triazines, this would be, atrazine would be in this group, okay, linearon, so they have good mobility but move through the apoplast, that's why these are the photosynthetic inhibitors, okay? Whereas literal no mobility, that's treflan, EPTC in this group, okay, acyfluorophen or fomosafen, okay? So if you could divide these up in this kind of category, it will give you an idea of where you expect to see the damage, okay? So, take-home messages, okay? Herbicides, particularly the cuticle, will be selective, okay? But if the herbicide doesn't stay long enough on the surface, it's not getting in. But if it does, it's important. If it moves through, if you're trying to control a perennial weed, you need to have the herbicide move through the phloem, the living part of the cell. However, the plant cannot be killed too quickly, otherwise the whole transportation system breaks down, okay? Soil is typically, and roots are not a major barrier to, to herbicides, especially if the plants are young. And that's true of, you know, foliar applied herbicides, okay? And that herbicides that are, go through the symplasm go both above and below ground, growing tips and, and rhizomes. That's, you're going to have to use that kind of information to help you in the herbicide, you know, symptomology and trying to figure out where things are. So this is kind of a, a, a you know, just giving you a sense of the key components of, or of, of uh, absorption. So what we're going to do next class is we're going to look at specifically the mechanisms of action. Some of you asked, you know, what is that thing with glyphosate? Where is this happening and what, what are the amino acids? We're going to go through that the, and then we'll talk about why are some plants selective? Why are not getting killed? Okay. And then lastly, we'll talk about herbicide resistance and environmental impact of herbicides. Okay, so it'll be all coming together and reinforcing what you're okay, learning in lab. Questions? Concerns? If not, don't forget to take...